Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As you're coming in the webinar room, I want to thank you for coming and also introduce myself. My name is Marche. I'm the webinar director here at Advice Chaser. And before we get going, I do need to do a little bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars, such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. Well, we are thrilled to bring you this educational presentation and a couple of items about uh, our attendees. And Leo, you can go ahead and go to the next slide there. Attendees are muted, but we do encourage you to ask questions using the chat box. The, presenters will, the presenter will answer these queries during or after the presentation today as appropriate. If you ask a question in the chat box, go ahead and leave your phone number and email address as well. And if we're not able to get to your question during today's presentation, we'll make sure someone reaches out to you after today's event. Again, we want this experience to be as educational as possible. So please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. Uh, Leo, I don't know if we are having a little bit of technical issues here, but I'm only seeing the disclaimer slide still. If we can go ahead and pop the next one up, awesome. Well, I'd love to introduce you to our presenter today. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Leo Wong is a fiduciary financial planner with Grand Fest Financial Group, specializing in new client acquisition and market research. Leo, the youngest of three boys, was born in Malaysia and immigrated to the United States at a young age. Leo and his family went on to successfully own and operate several restaurants throughout central New Jersey. And Leo graduated from Christian Brothers Academy and Monmouth University with a BS in finance and currently resides in Monmouth County, New Jersey. About his reasons for becoming a financial advisor, Leo says, my passion for becoming a financial advisor stemmed from the seeds that my parents planted when they came to America in the early 90s. As a restaurant entrepreneur, my parents worked 72 hours per week that provided food and shelter for the family for over a decade. And as grateful as I was for my parents instilling work ethic upon my siblings and I, they never developed a retirement nest egg for themselves. As a first generation immigrant, I can relate with those who work hard to provide for their family but lack the knowledge or insight to plan for retirement. And that is why it brings me a sense of fulfillment when I'm able to help families plan for their future. And I know that's what we're going to do today, especially for those who uh, qualify for special provisions in, uh, in retirement as a federal employee. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over the time to you, Leo. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Marche. Uh, as she had said, uh, I am a fiduciary financial planner, uh, but I do specialize in the federal retirement market. Uh, in fact, our group holds a very unique designation uh, called the Chartered Federal Employee Benefit Consultant. Uh, which basically means we have the knowledge uh, to help you shed some light into this complicated provision that we're going to go over uh, that only applies to certain agencies. For our agenda today, it's going to be light but impactful. Uh, we are going to talk about what does a special provision retirement uh, apply to in, in regards to the different groups. Uh, we are going to go over the retirement eligibility. Uh, in other words, it's different from the traditional FERS coverage uh, that a majority of federal employees are uh, under. Uh, we are going to go over the calculation on your pension 
And that also differs from the traditional 1% multiplier uh, for most uh, federal employees as well. And then of course, I'm gonna cover additional benefits uh, for the special provision retirement as well as examples. Uh, as a side note, I do wanna point out uh, that there are way too many minor details to cover throughout this webinar, but Marche, I'll be sure to cover the major components uh, that will be most impactful. Yes, I, I, I'm assuming it is uh, definitely an individualized plan when you get right down to it. Yes, uh, this is one of those uh, retirement plans or provisions uh, that only apply to people that know that they're in it. Uh, if you don't know if you're in this or not, most likely you're not. Uh, however, let's just dive right into it uh, to uncover what groups do these apply to. Uh, so there are six primary ones, uh, starting with the law enforcement officers, also known as LEO provision, uh, the firefighters, air traffic controllers, police capital, Supreme Court police, as well as unique group called the nuclear weapons couriers. Now, some agencies that have these groups are the agencies such as CDP, ICE, FAA, the USPC, and the National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, so if you're within these agencies, uh, there's a chance that this might apply to you. But once again, it's something that you should already know. Uh, if it does or not, uh, today my job is to just add some clarification uh, in understanding how uh, everything works pertaining to your pension and, and then some. So let's dive into the retirement eligibility portion. Now, there's two parts to this slide uh, that you see here, and I'm gonna cover the first part, which is FERS versus the special provision. So the, the two uh, boxes uh, that you see there. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, the other two talking points as well. So let's dive into the, the boxes here because I want to uh, show a clarification between the normal FERS retirement, which is a majority of federal employees, versus the special provision side, which in, in this case, I wrote down CVP officers or the LEO provision. And the reason being is uh, the, large, the larger of the groups is the uh, CVP officers uh, or people under the LEO provision. So the qualifiers goes as follows. If you're under the normal first, there's three sets that you need to, either, what, you have to hit one of the three sets here in order to have what's called a qualified retirement. So the first set is MRA plus 30 years of service. Uh, the second set is 60 years of age plus 20 years of service. And then the third set is 62 years of age with five years of service. Now, Marche, th those are, um, you know, you need a combination of the age and the years in order to qualify. You can't have one or the other. Okay, so that's under the normal retirement eligibility for FERS. However, on the right side for the special provision, it's a little bit different. And it starts off with, it, with any age, you can retire as long as you have 25 years of special provision years. Or you could be age 50 with 20 years under the special provision years. And then the last one is age 57 with also 20 years uh, for special provision years. But the unique thing about the last one is it's a mandatory retirement. In other words, if you have the full 20 years under the special provision years at 57 is the latest you can work till uh, you are forced on mandatory retirement at that point. Okay, so those are the qualifiers. And, and I'll, I'll go through some examples later on to kind of help you see how it works. But once again, you must have the age and the years of service together at the same time in order to have a qualified retirement. So those are the qualifiers. Now let's talk a little bit on the left side here about the sick leave and military leave. I'm sorry, military service. So sick leave starting in 2014 uh, was uh, implemented towards uh, or used towards your years of service to calculate your uh, first pension. Now this uh, calculation is only applied towards the 1% multiplier side, okay? So in other words, 
if you have one year of sick leave, that one year of sick leave, which is roughly around 2,087 hours, can only apply towards the years of service for the 1% multiplier side, not under the special provision side, which is 1.7. And for the military uh, service years, in most cases, buying back in military time is worth it, especially if you do it within the first three years coming out of the military because you don't pay any interest. And the longer you wait to buy back in military years, the, the higher the interest builds. So highly recommend in most situations that you do buy back in military time to have those years counted towards uh, your age, your FERS uh, uh, pension calculation for whichever civilian agency you decide to get into. So, so th those are one additional little uh, things that I wanna outline. Uh, the second part is your FERS supplement. Now, also, this is also known as a special retirement supplement. And this is an extra paycheck that you get in addition to your pension as long as you qualify, have a qualified retirement. Now, if you're under the special provision, you might be receiving a FERS supplement as early as age 50 as long as you have 20 years of the special provision years calculated. Uh, so you can start getting a first supplement as early as age 50, which then can go all the way till age 62. So that's a full 12 years. Uh, but you know, once, you, uh, once you hit 62, it does drop off, but then you'll be eligible for, a, uh, for your social security benefits in lieu of your first supplement. Right, so those are some of the retirement eligibilities uh, that you have to achieve and some of those additional items that I wanna point out. Now let's dive into the next portion here then, and that is how to calculate your pension. So let's start off with the basics. Calculating your FERS pension, also known as a FERS annuity, is very straightforward. They take the years of service, multiply by your high three uh, income, multiply by 1%. So in this example, this person has 30 years of service times 100,000 times 1%, which will result in an annual pension of 30,000 a year or roughly around $2,500 a month. Now there is a little special, uh, little uh, <clears throat> extra 10% bump if you are over the age of 20, uh, 62 and you have over 20 plus years of service, Instead of a 1% multiplier, they use a 1.1%. And this is applied towards the normal FERS retirement uh, calculation for the pension. Uh, and that results in 33,000 a year or roughly around 2750 per month for normal FERS. However, if you're on the special retirement provision side, the calculation's a little different. And for some people, it might be a mixture of the two. Here's what I mean. So anyone that is under the special retirement provision for their pension calculation, they actually use a 1.7% multiplier, which if you look at it compared to 1%, it's actually 70% higher when it comes to calculating their pension. And then uh, the most you can have under the 1.7% multiplier is 20 years under the special retirement provision. So 20 years is the maximum. So I applied that. And then times 100%, I'm sorry, 100,000 for their high income average would result in 34,000 a year or roughly around 2832 per month for just the Leo provision years calculation. Well, what if this person had more than 20 years uh, working uh, under the special retirement provision? Let's say if they had 25 years. Well, the remaining five years will be calculated on the second portion, which is at, as I mentioned before, at the 1% level, and it could be before or after uh, uh, certain years, uh, but it has to be within the outside scope of the 20 years of the LEO, I'm sorry, uh, the special retirement provision. Uh, but for the five years, it'll be calculated at 1% times 100%, 100,000, my apologies, 100,000 for the high uh, three average income, which then would result in an extra 5,000 a year in the pension 
or about $416 per month. So when you do those two separate calculations, uh, you will get a annual pension of 39,000 a year or roughly 3250 per month. We did have a question here, Leo, about that high three average income. That's just mm -hmm. an example. So it could be more or less depending on the on the individuals. Yes. Uh, highest three average income years, correct? That is correct. Some people will be lower, some people will be higher. Really just depends on the agency and the group that you're part of. Um, I know some people that make closer to 150,000 uh, a year for their high three average, uh, but uh, it will vary and, and you just input your high three accordingly uh, to do your own calculations. Okay, and then we had one other question here. So this is calculated based on your total years. So if you have over 20 years, this isn't like, uh, this isn't like two separate uh, pension calculations in separate parts of your pension. This is just for the one pension you get as when you retire, correct? So it's one pension, but it's two calculations because the first part is the 1.7 which can only be applied for 20 years. That's the maximum you can collect at 1.7% multiplier under the special retirement provision. The remainder years will only be at 1%. Uh, okay, that helps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great question, by the way. Uh, and this is something that is uh, not explained very clearly uh, on OPM's website, uh, nor you know, a lot of the other resources out there. So. Uh, I'm glad I can clarify there. All right, so that's the pension calculation uh, that, that is uh, applied for special retirement provision. Now, let's talk about some of the additional benefits uh, that apply also for that provision. Now, these are a little bit less known, but also equally as important to point out. And the first one is your COLAs on your, there are COLAs on your pension, but there are no COLAs on your FERS supplement. Now, COLAs stand for cost of living adjustment, and it's kind of designed to combat inflation. Uh, it's kind of like the old saying, Marche, a dollar today is not the same dollar tomorrow. <laughs> and well, great. with the current climate, I think most people understand that. And, and, and uh, last year and this year is a prime example, very true, especially with 9% inflation this year, you can see that firsthand how it really plays out. Now, for your COLAs on the pension, it does start year one when you retire. And that's very unique because if you were under the normal FERS retirement system, COLAs only kick in starting at age 62. So that is a huge benefit. You might be collecting COLAs for 10 years plus uh, before the normal FERS employees gets to get their uh, uh, COLAs adjusted on the pension. Uh, however, for the FERS supplement, uh, there is never COLAs on either, uh, uh, either groups. Uh, so that will stay stagnant uh, leading up to age 62. And that's when the FERS supplement automatically drops off but then that's when most people turn on their social security benefit in lieu of that. Not that you have to, but you're eligible to. Now, the second part is the TSP. Now, what's exciting is you have access to your TSP money as early as age 50 without the 10% early withdrawal penalty. Under normal circumstances, you do have to worry, wait till you're 59 and a half in order to take money out of your TSP without the 10% penalty. So this is a very unique and special rule for people that have qualified retirement under the special retirement provision uh, to be able to access the money that early without penalties. Now, the one thing that you cannot avoid is taxes. All right, I get that question a lot. Well, can I avoid taxes on this? No, there's no way around it. Uncle Sam will get his piece. Uh, but Here's another thing though. Uh, we as financial planners do not recommend taking money out of your TSP at such a young age. And the reason being is you might be living for another 40 
years uh, beyond that age. And if that's the case, you want to make sure you continuously invest and build that retirement nest egg uh, for the long term. Now, the third part is what's called a first supplement earnings test. And that can start at as early as age 57. I'm sorry, it does start at age 57 for a majority of people. And the test is at $19,560 for the year 2022. And they do adjust that accordingly uh, you know, throughout the years. Now, the earnings test on the first supplement is just like what you would have for social security earnings tests if you were working full-time and collecting social security before your full retirement age. Now, it only applies at your what's called MRA, minimum retirement age, which under the special retirement provision rules, majority of people will be at age 57. So in other words, if you turn 57 and you are retired collecting your pension and your first supplement, and you decide to go out and get a job, full-time income, and you make above $19,560 that year, for every $2 you make above that number, they will reduce your first supplement by $1. Okay, so there's an earnings test that you have to be cautious of, okay, which leads me to the next part here, which is working in the private sector or starting your own business when you retire as a special retirement uh, a provision. It's a very unique rule where from age as early for some of uh, the folks that qualify for retirement at age 50, all the way till age 57 you can actually work and uh, a full time, get a full-time income, start a business, collect your first pension and your, uh, your first supplement with no negative repercussions, right? So those seven years are very unique where a lot of people could still really bank a lot of money uh, if they decide to go work in the private sector or start a business in those years because there is no earnings test. The earnings test on the first supplement only kicks in at the MRA at 57, as I said before. Uh, and that's when most people want to be a little bit more cautious about working a full-time income and collecting the first supplement. In fact, some people do so well in the private sector or starting business that they might just forego the first supplement because they make so much more uh, in the private sector. So those are some things to consider but very nice benef benefit to have to know that those important years when you are retired, you can, uh, you know, quote unquote, double dip, so to speak, uh, collecting a pension for a supplement and of course, uh, a earn uh, full-time income with no penalties, all right? So, uh, uh, so those are the four main components of the additional benefits there. Now, I know it's a lot to talk about just concepts high level, so what I put together here is also some example slides to kind of go over some of those uh, specific scenarios that may apply for some of you. So uh, we're gonna talk about Sally. here. Now, Sally started working as a air traffic controller with the FAA at age 30. Sally decides that she will work the full 20 years and she retires at the early age of 50 because she has a qualified retirement under the first special retirement provision. Uh, she then goes ahead and collects her first pension and her first supplement starting at age 50, but she's also uh, recruited to go work at a consulting firm in the private sector from age 50 to age 57. And during that time, she gets to collect her first pension, and her first supplement for seven years, right? In addition to her full-time income that she's collecting as a consultant at the private sector. No penalties whatsoever. And then when she turns 57, she decides, I had enough, I'm going to retire. So at 57, she goes ahead and retires. Uh, and then her first supplement will continue all the way till 62, but then she will turn on her social security at 62 in replacement of her first supplement. 
So that is the timeline of an example of someone that is maximizing their potential with collecting their pension for a supplement and working a full-time income and knowing the rules behind it so they're not negatively impacted by it as well. The second example here is Billy. Now, Billy works as a customs and border protection officer, and he started in 2001 at age 40 as his second career. Billy could have came from the private sector. He could have been military uh, all those times, but this is his second career. Billy works for 22 years and decides to retire at age 62. Now, CBP works a little differently because their LEO provision, also known as a special retirement provision, didn't start until July of 2008. So his will be a little, a little bit wonky. So for his pension calculation, uh, seven years right, uh, of those are at the normal FERS at 1% because he started in 2001, but the LEO provision did not kick in until 2008. So that's why you have those seven years there. But from 2008 onwards till when he retires, which is the remainder 15 years, he will collect the first uh, the uh, Leo provision at 1.7 multiplier. So he'll have a combination of the two. Uh, he will be retiring under the normal first retirement eligibility uh, column, but will have uh, a, a partial special retirement provision included in there. Now, if your head is spinning a little bit from that little snippet, it's, uh, it's very normal. Uh, unless you're part of CBP, uh, 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 the agency, you're not really going to know all those intricacies anyways. Uh, so that's why it's very important that we're able to provide these resources and educate folks because uh, it can get a little hairy depending on when they started, when the provision started, and, and how many years of service they have. And then, of course, for Billy, uh, because he's 62, at, uh, he's going to turn on his Social Security. Uh, but he's not eligible for a first supplement just due to the fact that he's over the age of 62. Uh, and first supplement only applies for people that have a qualified retirement before the age of 62. Okay. We, we did have a question here. Mm -hmm. So you said that uh, the LEO provision for C CBP didn't start till July 2008. Is that just when the federal government implemented it for that agency? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, so it's, you know, it's one of those things where uh, the government always makes changes to different uh, retirement programs, uh, some for the better, some for worse. Uh, and uh, this just so happened to apply to CBP uh, uh, because of a lot of political events. But they have been gun carrying, uh, uh, been in a gun carrying role, which should qualify under the LEO provision as law enforcement officers but they never had that designation until 2008 when, uh, when they decided to pass that to include them under that, uh, that umbrella. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that clarification there. Yeah. So for anyone that are federal employees, they, they, they know things change throughout the years. Um, and, and that's why you have to stay on top of it because uh, it, it, it changes your, uh, your calculations as well. All right. So uh, was there more questions, Marcia? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions before we end out. So um, talking about the cost of living adjustments, um, does that apply to regular FERS as well? Uh, it does apply to regular FERS, but only starting at age 62. OK, mm -hmm. that was a good question. All right. Um, how are how is your pension taxed? So your pension is taxable on a federal level. Uh, on a state level, it depends on the state you live in, but a majority of the states uh, are uh, do not tax federal pensions either. Uh, so you you're gonna have to uh, you know uh, look at that yourself to to uh, find out more about the state side. Uh, but it's uh, taxed at your ordinary income uh, level. Uh, however, uh, I'm not a CPA, so I do advise you to speak with a tax professional regarding that furthermore. All right. And then we had one more question. 
it's a really kind of a broad question, but what are some of the most common mistakes you see federal employees making when they're looking at their retirement? Uh, it is a very broad one there of, let's see, common mistakes. Uh, I would just say understanding uh, the deductions that come out of their pension uh, when they uh, do the calculation. So great example would be when you look at the slide that I went over uh, and did the cal pension calculation, you might get excited over $3,400 per month from just a pension. However, a lot of people uh, that don't plan accordingly, what we see is they, they forget to you know, deduct some of the amounts, thank you, uh, for their health insurance coverage, all right? Uh, maybe deduct uh, the amount for their life insurance coverage or their dental and vision, or they forget to incorporate uh, federal taxes out of their pension, which then would reduce that net number to a lower amount. Uh, and, and that would um, obviously cause them uh, some financial uh, missteps uh, if they didn't incorporate that calculation and understood how that would affect them, especially throughout retirement. Uh, and I guess the other one that would be in conjunction to that would be their, their FEGLI costs, uh, which stands for Federal Employee Group Life Insurance, uh, especially that option B coverage, which is the one to five times multiple of their salary. Uh, that premium goes up every five years in retirement. Uh, I'm sorry, every five years, regardless of working or retirement. So the people that are not conscious of that uh, get kind of blindsided when the premium starts doubling every five years, uh, starting in the mid 50s, uh, where they end up just dropping it uh, when they're in the 60s or even 70s. And they, they have to continue going through retirement underinsured because uh, maybe they're not at good health or uh, they, you know, it just costs an arm and a leg at that point. So that would be another common mistake that we see as well. Thank you for that. And again, that kind of uh, emphasizes the need to talk with a financial advisor who's really, uh, really well-versed in these kind of ins and outs of the federal retirement system that were very different from, you know, regular retirement planning for the private sector. Yeah, uh, a good analogy that I've heard recently was, you know, when, when we have uh, certain uh, ailments, diseases, or uh, bodily pains, we would go see a doctor to seek advice, right? Uh, we wouldn't self-diagnose ourselves just because, you know, it's more costly that way because your health is the most- Oh, you mean less thing. costly at yeah, Dr. Google? <laughs> right, right, right. Go on uh, WebMD and try to diagnose yourself. No, you, you seek a professional uh, because the health is the most important thing to you, but your retirement should be the second most important thing. And, and you should seek advice on that as well, especially with these really complicated intricacies uh, with the special retirement provision. Well, Leo, thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have for the questions. Um, I will say, as I'm doing my outro, if you didn't have a chance to ask your question, go ahead and leave it in the comments and uh, we will reach out to you and make sure that gets addressed. Well, I want to thank our attendees for attending. On behalf of Advice Chaser, uh, thank you so much. And thanks to the organizations that have made this webinar possible today. For our attendees, look for an email soon with a link to the replay of this event, and you're welcome to share that replay with friends and family. I will say that uh, Leo has also presented with us about um, retirement for federal employees on a separate webinar, and we'll make sure to link that to the page where it has this, um, this recording on our website, but you can also look that up. It should be on our website as well right now. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor who's a great fit for your life and your financial questions. Our matching service is free to you and every one of our advisor partners has committed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Well, once again, from Advice Chaser, thank you so much for coming. 
and we'll see you at another webinar soon. Goodbye, everyone.